Ja, nu är vi igång. Välkomna tillbaka, säger jag. Lagstiftning och digital övervakning blir ju allt viktigare att diskutera under den här coronapandemin. När den personliga integriteten ställs mot säkerheten och tryggheten. Det här seminariet arrangeras av Internetstiftelsen och Utbildningsradion. Moderator för det här seminariet är Mette Hultgren som har arbetat som journalist i över 20 år. Bland annat som redaktör och tv-producent. Och sen tre år tillbaka är hon eh, strateg på Utbildningsradion. Hej Mette! Hej Alexandra! Hur står det till? Jo tack, det är bra. Vi laddar in för seminariet nu. Ja, det ska bli så himla spännande. Och jag tänker att ni är ju Mette det enda mediebolaget som är med i det här nätverket Mik Sverige. Eh, som ju arrangerar det här spåret som heter Medier, makt och farligt medborgarskap. Hur kommer det sig att ni är de enda som är med? Eller varför är det viktigt för er att vara med? Ja, men för oss, vi, vi har ju producerat program kring det, ja, medie- och informationskunnighet i 20 års tid kanske. Och det här är en av våra viktigaste frågor. Och i grunden är det ju här en, en demokratisk fråga. Att informera sig till att, att människor har kunskap. Både att ja, men sådana enkla, basala, digitala kunskaper som att veta hur ett mobilt bank i det funkar för att ta del av olika samhällstjänster. Men också eller naturligtvis att kunna kritiskt värdera, analysera information, veta hur man skiljer på sant, falskt och vad som kanske är mitt emellan. Så därför var det självklart för oss. Vi eh, tycker det här är viktigt. Mm. Och då eh, är, är du eh, redo antar jag att ta över nästa fettpinnen och moderera samtalet som vi så ser fram emot med det. Tack så mycket Alexandra. Tack. Då hälsar jag alla välkomna till det här seminariet Lagstiftning och digital övervakning som ju arrangeras av UR. Digitaliseringen har vitaliserat demokratin i flera avseenden och det är idag enklare för människor att ta del av och sprida information liksom att engagera varandra i olika frågor. Samtidigt kan den digitala tekniken användas för övervakning med mer eller mindre goda syften och redan idag samlas stater och regioner in stora mängder personlig data. Även kommersiella aktörer gör det för att förstå våra köpbeteenden. Å andra sidan så kan insamlingen av personlig data också användas för att underlätta vardagen för oss. I Estland som vi kommer att höra talas om, eh, ibland kallat för världens mest digitaliserade land, finns det snart sagt Snart ingenting som medborgarna inte kan göra digitalt. Och det estländska folket är så här långt positiva till den digitaliserade statsapparaten eftersom de upplever att den förenklar tillvaron. Nyckeln till tilliten stavas lagstiftning som ska ge medborgarna äganderätten till all sin data. Men frågan är om det är tillräckligt för att skydda dem och vad kan vi i Sverige dra för lärdomar av Estlands väg? Och hur ska vi förhålla oss till en allt mer datadriven tillvaro? Det är vad detta panelsamtal i huvudsak kommer att kretsa kring. And now I'll switch language and introduce Mr. Ott Velsberg, Chief Data Officer for the Estonian Government. Hello Ott. Hi. You can turn. Hi. And very welcome to this seminar on legislation and, and digital surveillance. Uh, you will give us an introduction about the Estonian way and just let me start off with say, telling that in Estonia all citizens have national identity card which enables them to carry out almost all contacts with authorities, schools, uh, healthcare institutions and even vote for parliament. The more data the better service to the citizens. Is that true and if so what is the reasoning behind? Please Ott. Yes, uh, so I think everyone is familiar that in Estonia, uh, most of the public services are online. So it is possible to fill in your taxes in less than three minutes. It is possible to get a permit to cut down a Christmas tree. Uh, it takes less than 30 seconds. So every possible interaction is all, already online. And as part of how we have achieved this is really build the trust that citizens trust what government does. So a few years ago, we had a small minor, not so minor to be honest, uh, crisis regarding uh, ID cards. 
And we didn't actually see that the number of citizens using government services to drop, it actually continues to increase. And we really do imagine that citizens are in charge of their own data. They must have a control and transparency of when the government uses their data. So already right now, government, uh, government shows in national portal when they use different registry data. So transparency, that's a key aspect in everything the government does. And just to kind of wrap up, um, we try to put the citizen in the center of everything we do. And um, what does it relate to? We try to make the government really as lean and as proactive as possible. So whenever possible, we try to get the human element away from the whole equilibrium. So for instance, we are right now, we already have life event services live. So for instance, if, we, if you have a child, then it is possible to register the child to the kindergarten waiting list, even before actually having the child. Knowing how much money the government will pay you uh, when the child is finally born, choose his or her name beforehand. The idea is to really help the citizen and not to build the bureaucracy that in many countries we do see. So you were talking about some crisis. Uh, could you please go a bit further down there? Uh, yes. Uh, so happen? we... Uh, yes, uh, so we had an ID crisis, and uh, the problem with the ID card, their digital signature, can be uh, to some degree um, hacked. Can you still hear me? Yeah, it was a bit a bit hard in the beginning. So you you could maybe you could say it once again. Okay, so uh, I saw something as well. Um, so the problem was uh, that the ID card um, or some of the ID cards, there was a slight possibility that their digital signatures can be hacked. So people can open up digital containers uh, which have information containing uh, to the citizen or they can uh, kind of, uh, let's say, have great digital signatures so they can uh, do things that the citizen can do with their digital signature itself. Um, it was not an issue created by the government, but by the digital card service provider uh, situated in uh, France. And it was actually found out by researchers from Austria. Um, however, the government was quite open about it uh, from the first moment it happened, saying that this is the risk. Mm. This many ID cards are affected. So far, we found find that no one has had their ID stolen, but we are working on it. Mm. So it took us um, a few heavy months of working. And when previously people would have thought that um, being transparent about the risks and so forward actually reduces uh, citizens' trust. It actually increases. So if there is actually anything wrong, you need to be transparent about it. You need to be transparent about risks that can occur because risks do occur. So right now people are talking about uh, AI all the time, that there is bias. Bias happens all the time. Bias happens also in regular IT developments. So we need to acknowledge the risks that occur by moving to digital. And I think this is um, like the internet days is a really good and valuable day for everyone to think through the risks that we have, but also the possibilities. Because there is always both sides. Mm. So with the, the risks at hand and, and uh, the crisis you had, how come the Estonians still are willing to give away the data? Uh, as you said, it can easily be misused, but still it seems that they still have a very high trust. 
Yeah. Uh, so when it comes to personal data, um, the government itself doesn't own data. It, we just are basically we are uh, holding citizen data. So citizens are in charge. Um, what it means is that we are right now working on a consent management platform to give citizens a possibility to um, give access to their government health data to private sector, uh, to third parties, so forward. So government health data can be used uh, to build new services. For instance, um, we have over 200,000 Estonians who have donated their uh, DNA or genome data to the government biobank. So if um, the listeners are un uh, unfamiliar, in Estonia, we have 1.3 million people. So it's a quite huge number of uh, citizens that have already agreed to donate their gene data to the government. And now we are giving a possibility for them to share that data to private sector organizations or non-governmental organizations so they can build new services on top of the data the government right now holds. So we are already working with uh, multiple, uh, multiple I, um, companies in healthcare sector, but also in transportation sector. So um, giving a possibility to share and use data and transparency, as I mentioned before, if you go to the government portal, you can see when government organizations have used your data and the reason for that. So of course, we are still kind of uh, in, in my own mind, in the middle. So there is uh, still some registries, information systems that need to have a data tracker integrated. But this is a key aspect. And uh, of course, our X road, which is our data exchange layer that we use between government and private sector, um, the logs, they are open as well. So researchers, uh, different uh, interested stakeholders, they are already analyzing and identifying anomalies and so forward. So being transparent, building the trust. Uh, sorry, someone is calling in. So um, I think this is kind of a really short overview, not so short, but still. That's interesting. I'm thinking of with your history of being forced into to be the part of the Soviet unit, wouldn't you expect a greater skepticism from the citizens? So I think people would actually expect, and this is uh, kind of uh, the typical standpoint that in many other um, previous Soviet Union countries, we do see that there is mistrust towards mm -hmm. uh, the government. Um, but I think our journey from the day one kind of led us to another situation we are today. So we started to collaborate with private sector. Um, there was also a huge interest towards making the government really kind of a zero bureaucracy. People saw what happens when the government is in charge of everything. At the same time, um, the transparency aspect. This this is carried out from from the time I was actually not even born. So from the day one, people wanted uh, to have as liberal a country as possible, that every citizen has their own choice. And we have tried to take this kind of uh, um, innovative mind to the government as well. So trying to make it as efficient as possible, trying to stand out. And in the end, through this, um, I think we have found kind of our IT tiger, uh, if we can say so. And uh, today, citizens are actively, this has carried out to private sector as well. Um, last week, we got our uh, fourth unicorn. So by those numbers, Estonia is extremely small country, but still we see that IT sector as a whole, it's huge and it continues to drive. So I think the overall, um, with the generation, the mindset has now completely changed. Okay, very interesting. Thank you very much for this introduction and you'll stay with us and yes. join the discussion. 
Uh, and I would like to introduce the other panelists here in Sweden. And uh, I'll start off with Marcin Lekaminski, uh, Director of the Global Department for Human Rights Defenders at Risk at the Swedish Human Rights Organization civil rights defenders, and with a long experience of exploring how technology and societal change could be further connected. And we have Anne-Marie Eklund Lövinder, uh, Chief Information Security Officer at the Swedish Internet Foundation, and one of seven trusted community representative and crypt officers, which means you have one of the keys uh, of internet. And also, I have to mention, you are the first Swede to be elected into the Internet Hall of Fame. Welcome. And Matthias Beimo, author, strategist and lecturer with a long experience in digital transformation uh, among companies as well as public authorities. And uh, with a great expertise on different aspects and consequences of digital surveillance. Welcome all. Uh, I, first of all, I wonder how close to the Estonian digitalized states have we come here in Sweden? Matthias, would you start? Yes, thank you. And thank you all for, for a great overview of the Estonian thoughts and plans and uh, track record. Um, technology, as you can see in the Estonian example, has long been a great tool for democracy, but it kind of seems now that democracy is starting to become a tool for technology. Um, and in Sweden, we can see um, the pandemic, the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic is, is becoming a driver for also our state to, to um, think of and try to find ways of tracking, the, using data to track the spread of the pandemic. Not so long ago, there was a government sponsored competition here in Sweden where a private company um, won that competition. Um, the government deemed them as the winner. And uh, their uh, basic idea was that people go and get tested for COVID-19. Uh, they pay like 300 euros for that. And then when they have a clean sheet, they get a little, little sign in an app in their smartphone saying that they're clean from COVID-19. They belong to the, so to speak, clean group of citizens. And this is exactly what countries like China, but also other democracies uh, have used, choose using QR codes like the code system to uh, make them show at checkpoints and going into stores and railway stations that they're free from COVID-19. And it, and it seems like it's totally possible that this will occur here too. I mean, imagine the social implications when you when you have a sign in your smartphone saying that you belong to the group of people, in this case, free from COVID-19, and maybe in another case, genetically belonging to a group, if you, connect, if you collect the genetical data, plus like you, you do in Estonia, and you, you need to show this in different uh, applications with a, with, a, with a very nice and, and liberal government, that might be okay, but then the government changes. And then maybe um, you have a political turmoil situation like you've had in Estonia. Well, then it's not so fun anymore. So, I mean, this uh, development that we can see here where data is given uh, the driver's seat instead of governance. Um, we've seen that before. We've seen science on other parts uh, of the human uh, society, not in smartphones, but on their clothes before. And that was not a very good way to walk. And that's disturbing to see uh, that we also in Sweden are actually going down that route currently. Anne-Marie, what do you say? Would it even be possible to Sweden to follow the Estonian way? Well, of course, partly, but still we have to remember that Estonia is a young country uh, with a small population, uh, everybody more or less knows each other more than we do in Sweden. I visited actually uh, a year ago or one and a half year ago, together with the Swedish uh, Contingencies Agency, uh, to, to actually take more uh, part of or learning more about what Estonians have done. What I do admire, and I'm a bit envy, is that they have from the beginning been thinking about the citizen it's not digital first it's citizen first which should actually be the way to go and another thing is that they have um, this ownership 
because you have the once only principle. You leave your data once and you leave it to some of the agencies and they can um, decide whether they will share it with other agencies. But then again, you as a citizen will get the information about when it happens and why it happens. And you can object to it if you like. So, but as Otten mentioned, it hasn't been a flawless road to, to the digitalization they had. I mean, that was a huge incident with the, with the digital cards, uh, the identity cards. But then again, they are very, very pragmatic and I admire them for that. Yeah. Marcin, from a citizen point of view, uh, it seems that the Estonian way has much improved and simplified everyday life. So why hesitate? You see it dangerous. Yeah, I, I have also been to Estonia and I'm impressed by, by the innovations and, and the scale of, of the, the digital inclusiveness of the country. Uh, I think that we in, in Sweden, we're, uh, we have a good starting point when it comes to becoming more digital, even though I'm, I'm, I'm also um, aligned with uh, both Anne-Marie and Matthias when it comes to commenting. But I think that the two biggest challenges that we see from a civil society perspective is partially the uh, the recent or the, the cases over the last couple of years uh, where we have seen um, big data collections uh, being uh, targeted by hackers or being disclosed because of uh, uh, low and digital competency in, in the firms that have been responsible for those data collections. And that is social data that may, may or may not be sensitive, but that really decreases the trust in the digital infrastructure that is uh, that we need to trust in order to become more digitalized. Uh, the other part that, that we are worried about is uh, is what we have seen in as an increase of requests specifically from law enforcement to collect additional data uh, concerning citizens uh, and for in those arguments the, the kind of the, the argument for collecting that data has been efficiency when it comes to law enforcement. But from our perspective, we see that as a crucial risk if we have a government collecting data that may be sensitive and uh, without the proper oversight. So that's uh, two, two kind of comments on, on that introductory mm -hmm. remark. And it seems also transparency and legislation uh, is, is good for protecting, but still there's a great possibility that it, data can be misused. Uh, Ot, how, how have you... The system could be uh, misused. So, so how do you, uh, how do you have you acted in order to ensure approval from the citizens, and as well as and, and asking them to act when when they find that the, maybe the data will be used by someone they didn't want to. Yeah. Um, so from from one side, um, as Anna Maria also mentioned, in Estonia. Um, if one agency has collected citizen data, then another agency is not that easily um, can use that data. So it is once only principle uh, whereby by legislation we mark down for which reasons data can be used and by which agency. So from that side, we kind of avoid situations where, whereby someone would just like to um, use data to find some um, whatever, uh, make predictions and so forward. But at the same time, it also affects how the government functions sometimes. So we are not that flexible or agile in carrying out different uh, projects, which can actually deliver huge benefits for the citizens and uh, for the government as well. So I'm just going to bring in an example. Uh, we know that people's social background is a strong indicator whether there is likely going to be a fire uh, in person's home. However, as that information um, concerning their uh, social background is not collected to predict fire hazards, we unfortunately cannot use that information. So our fire department still makes those inspections without that great knowledge that we have. So from one side, it is always about finding the best balance possible. Um, so this is one side. 
Um, when, when it comes to security, this is something that Estonia takes uh, really to its heart. Um, I'm, I'm not sure whether people remember, but Estonia was um, by all counts the first country that uh, faced full-blown cyber attack in 2000 and I think it was seven. Uh, so we, we had this kind of uh, lowly prong, uh, prompt uh, soldier monument that the government decided uh, to move and we faced huge cyber attacks from Russia. And because of that, in Estonia, we have NATO cyber uh, center. We are investing heavily in cybersecurity. Um, so cybersecurity in today's life is a key aspect, in short. Mm. Matthias, you seem like you, you were taking notes. <laughs> you saw me. Yeah, yeah um, while I do respect and have followed the... Uh, the Estonian, let me let call it the experiment since Mr. Corio's days. Um, it is interesting how you, you give the example of, of uh, the fire brigade collecting uh, social information about uh, habits and, and, and economical situations and so forth. I mean, if, um, and, and the citizens are approving of this. Approval is not transparency. Uh, when we approve the terms of service of this Zoom application that we're using now or Facebook or Google or whatever, that's not transparency. Saying that you approve, in this case of the Estonian government, to do X, Y, and Z is not transparency because you need... Uh, uh, I think a, we a lost IT is there. Sorry? Okay, I'll give the word to Marcin. Yeah, <laughs> you were nodded as well. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if we actually lost Matthias because uh, I think Matthias st is still with us, but I'm, I'm happy to, to continue because I really think that it's important that, that transparency, it, digitalization can bring transparency into different systems and that is something that's crucially needed. Uh, in today's society, it's, it, it is and, and will become even more difficult to, to be transparent if we are not using uh, the systems and infrastructure that, that is provided through digitalization. But I really think that the, the, the key is still to, to make sure to, uh, to uh, not overgather information, to minimize the collected data, and also to make sure to be transparent, not only in the collection, but also in the administration and also the, the uh, retention of data. I think that's uh, super important because otherwise we cannot really trust what kind of data is being handled by um, different authorities or different agencies and, and how that is used for the reason that or the purposes that have been stated or other purposes. Uh, so that there, there's a, a great need of transparency also in the information on, on, on how data is used, not only in, in the data system, so to speak. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Matthias, welcome back. We lost you for a couple of minutes. I'm not sure you lost me, but maybe you did. Um, no, I was saying that <laughs> approval is not uh, is not transparency. And when you make a little X in a box on Facebook or in on the Zoom app, then you you you're not you need a degree in computer sciences to understand what you're actually saying yes to. You cannot expect from citizens in a democracy, in a liberal democracy, to have that level and depth of understanding, and then uh, think that they will be. Uh, knowledgeable in how their data is used and how their rights is taken care of. That's not even possible. Uh, and it's, it's a very hard, hard road to follow if you want to live liberal democracy for real. Okay, Anne-Marie, you raise your hand. Yes, yeah, I want to actually underline that it's a very, very fine balance between need to have and nice to have when it comes to information. And I think that approach, the approach that Ott uh, mentioned or presents here is, uh, is a very good one. Uh, and also but about transparency, I think that is nothing, it's not one or zero. It's like, yeah, you can have transparency and it's an ongoing dialogue between people and among people. We have to keep, continue the debate that started with, uh, with uh, the retention law uh, in Sweden we had a number of years ago. I think we actually achieved something there. We did get a supervisory agency that are in control or are uh, responsible to make sure that uh, information is not abused 
even by the government uh, or, or the criminal uh, the police for, force and, and things like that but still it's nothing you solve once and for all you have to debate it every single day and make sure that the transparency is withheld to a certain level it's not guarantee that you have it or not have it Interesting. Thank you. Uh, I wonder what, what what kind of discussion or, or the um, complaints have you got from the citizens concerning that how how transparent the government are without with how the data is used? Has there been an, an discussion in, in Estonia? Yeah, absolutely. So I think what uh, Anna Maria just said is completely true. There is not one end goal that now the government is transparent enough or that we have a human-centric data governance in place. This is, as with every IT development, this is an ongoing process and uh, the society itself changes all the time. So when it comes to problems, of course, there are. Uh, so when we take, for instance, our data tracker, people still don't understand why the government sometimes accesses their data. The reasoning is too broad. So they, they are, they, for them, it is just strange. For instance, uh, a typical use case is that someone is abroad and uh, for instance, Tallinn, whereby you have free transportation, they are checking your uh, registration. So where are you registered to live? But they are doing that while you are away. But it is actually automated. Mm -hmm. uh, so for a person, it seems like I'm not uh, driving a bus right now. So that's strange. Why do they need to check where, I, uh, where I'm right now uh, registered to live? That seems so strange. However, if there would be a mark that this is an automated uh, check that uh, uh, City of Tallinn carry, uh, carries out each month to validate your registration, then it would make more sense to people. So being transparent in what the information actually means, providing actually education as well. So this is something that we need to invest, all of us. We are talking about cybersecurity, but in Estonia, we, we still need to work on data literacy, to be honest. And we are we're like moving towards a need where data literacy, understanding the risks of sharing data, that's a huge concern. And we are right now having the same discussion whether, whether we should give kind of a free access to citizens to decide how their health data is managed. To be honest, seeing the level of competence people sometimes have, I would say no. And seeing the companies that are right now behind our doors scraping to get access to that data, we shouldn't give uh, kind of free access to everyone. So this is an ongoing knowledge building uh, kind of task everyone has. Yeah. Matthias, looks like you're taking notes again. Yes, always, always. It's very interesting, and and I, as the same as all that, we've been working with this for decades, and 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 naturally there is a component of of uh, of actually innovating and making society better. And I don't want that to be lost in the in the conversation from my side. But um, the, the the American election, for one thing, had a component of a perception hack to it, and not an actual data hack, but a hack into the perception of the integrity of the election. The, the, now, what Donald Trump is doing is that, that he's driving the thesis that the election was rigged and is, is flawed in some ways. And that's exactly what happens if you, if you, put, um, if you, if you make something too complicated and, or new or vague, uh, like elections, uh, then you, when you don't have like a paper ballot and, and a pen, you make an X and then this is your, and if instead you have apps like they've done in the US, for instance, and I would presume that you're pursuing in Estonia to have e-elections. Um, when you do that, the system can be totally integral. The, the system can be great, the actual technical system, but the reliance on this, the system, the democratic system, 
is 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 has a, a, a flaw to it because people don't understand the techn technology underlying it, and people don't trust this new technology, and then you have a problem with the trust in the democratic ballot system. Uh, mm -hmm. So, and, and naturally, I also want, would like to not have to stand in line, or any American citizen would like to not to have to stand in line for hours to vote. It's ridiculous, but still. It is the way they keep their integrity in their liberal democracy. And when you start tampering with that, like in some ways, with all due respect, I think you're doing in Estonia, you are building a, a problem growing inside the democratic liberal system. So I, I think, to me, to be honest, the, the, the system in Estonia, or the, the, the e-governance e way in Estonia is somewhat something that scares me more and more each month, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, Otto will comment on that later on. First, Ma Martin, you raised your hand as well. I just wanted to add as well that uh, I think, for, from my perspective, what's, what is interesting with uh, the increased digitalization of different societal functions, such as we have seen in Estonia, is that you actually can bring inclusiveness and make sure that everyone can interact with governmental institutions and systems uh, on somewhat similar terms. And I think that we have good examples from that in Sweden as well, when I think that most of the population is actually interacting with our tax agency or the social security uh, service that we have uh, through digital tools that have been produced, I assume, and uh, partially because of transparency or inclusiveness reasons, uh, but may, uh, maybe also partially to lower overhead costs of the agencies, for instance. And that combination is, is good. Uh, and uh, really fruitful, I think. But if that is not also combined with uh, including the aspect of have increasing the dig digital trust of the backend systems of of the of the agencies, for instance, that may also uh, mean that the only gateway to the systems will be through uh, digital interaction. And those communities that are not online, for instance, or have a distrust in the systems from the beginning. Uh, will not be included as intended. Uh, so I think that it, that also needs to be taken into consideration, not over-digitalize uh, institutions, uh, but do it responsibly and also including the, the layer of trust, which I think is, is increasingly important. Mm -hmm. Anne-Marie, you wanted to comment as well. Yes, getting back to, to the first question, can we compare? Oh, well, I don't think that we can compare Sweden with Estonia because Estonia, they, they didn't need to take care of a legacy that we have. On the other hand, we have a, a lot of trust in Swedish government and trust is something you deserve over time. Uh, it's easy to use, it's hard to gain. We have had some, some time to gain it and I think we should be careful about it. Uh, the so this is not only a difference in, in technical uh, maturity or, or knowledge, but it's also a cultural thing. Um, Estonian is, as I mentioned before, a very young country, as Otto will probably uh, underline as well. And uh, they didn't have a legacy, so they could start actually from, from scratch to start the digitalization of the government, which is probably something that has led to uh, a much faster development. But I have to, to agree with Matthias and Anne Marcin as well. So you just be careful now when you take your steps to don't jump into a rat hole because uh, then it might be that you lose the, the confidence and the trust that people have in you already. Um, so that's my advice. Ot, what do you say? Your comments on, on your advice, on the advice to you. Yeah, so uh, the advice itself, um, it, it was actually a little bit unclear to me. Um, however, I can um, just say that we already have legacy as well. So we started 30 years ago. We had legacy back then. And if we consider how small Estonia is, then it is actually, from one side, it is always a great thing. We can uh, bring the same parallel that Finland is not uh, that huge. Um, we have Denmark or we have even Iceland. Iceland is even smaller than Estonia. So all of those countries, they are not huge. And there are many others as well. So if um, the population is an indicator, then everyone should 
be at the same point. Similarly, you have legacy if it's 30 years of building e-government. We have so much legacy that it hurts us. But at the same time, um, we see that it's really about the mindset question. And we uh, have today talked quite a few times about uh, kind of the trust and understanding how the technology uh, works. People don't need to know every detail of everything. Like they don't need to know programming, but they need to know how the system overall works and understands kind of how the government functions as well. They don't need to go in deep into the code and see everything, how it works. However, at the same time, we are trying to push actually open source uh, code as well. So everything the government does, we try to make open source whenever there are no risks associated. And uh, when it comes to IE voting, so internet voting, not electronic voting, then this is definitely something that we see that the citizens are continuing to uh, trust, they are continuing to use. During the last election, um, I think it was close to 44 or 46% of all Estonians voted using internet voting. Um, we have the transparency there. Similarly, we have found no risks associated. So this is just one way. And uh, at the same time, there are already, always risks, but technology here helps as well, whether it's misinformation or something else. Yeah. Okay. Do we have a lot? We, we're almost out of time. Do we have a short comment from anyone? Martin? Um, just a short comment. I, I think that we it's important with this, this, these discussions because we, we have countries that have come different far and we have things to learn and we learn best as, as peers and those conversations are important to, to keep on having together. Yes. So, and by that, our time is uh, over. And I will thank all of you for uh, participating in this seminar. And uh, now I leave the word over to Alexandra. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mette Hulken, and to all the other panelists. It was such an inspiring and interesting debate, I have to say. So, uh, nu är det snart dags för lunch. Och det kommer att ske aktiviteter i, våra digitala, i vår digitala utställningsyta i Expon. Och först ska vi också träffa redaktionen bakom den digitala tjänsten Digiteket. Och sen klockan 12.45 alltså kvart i ett, så kommer statens medieråd ha en avtalsceremoni med kommittén Demokratin 100 år. Och de har premiär för sin nya film och kommer också presentera den kommande kunskapsplattformen eh, inom MIK. Alltså, och det vet vi ju nu vad det betyder, va? MIK, eh, medie- och informationskunnighet. Det kommer bli väldigt intressant. Och vi ses igen klockan 14.00. Ha det underbart tills dess. Hej då!